Across the Fence, we'll explore the University of Vermont's Food Systems Summit. The annual event focuses on food and food-related issues here in this country and around the world. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We often talk about food on Across the Fence. It might be about food preparation or prices or issues such as marketing, nutrition, or access to food. Well, this afternoon our focus is again on food, but in the context of food systems and the annual UVM Summit. In just a few minutes, we're going to meet two of the summit's keynote speakers. But first, I want to welcome the dean of UVM Extension, Doug Lontine. Doug is also the director of UVM's Food Systems Initiative. It's nice to have you with us. It's great to be here, Judy. Maybe you can explain what the UVM Food Systems Summit is all about. Well, uh, you just mentioned that we have uh, some speakers coming to town, so it's always great to bring in great minds from other parts of the country uh, so we can pick them a little bit and learn uh, and interact with other academics and other practitioners and other institutions in this state to figure out where we're going with food systems in this state and where we might be able to contribute on the regional or national or the international level with the things that we learn and think about in the state of Vermont. And so why is it important to Vermonters to have their state university focused on food systems? Well, I think, you know, I, when I saw that question or heard it coming, um, I thought of three things. One, we have a long history in Vermont of uh, doing things first, uh, thinking about uh, big questions and pursuing them, even though some of us think, uh, some think Vermont's a small state, what can they do? But we have this long history of being first. Uh, second of all, I think we have a, 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 a um, a long history at the community level of solving problems. Um, and even though Vermont is a small state, communities all over the world are small. And so things we can learn at the community level can be applied, doesn't matter what the size of the state is, it really is at the community level that a lot of these things are worked on. And thirdly, we have some great expertise at the University of Vermont, all the way across the board, from my own faculty and extension, but on campus from uh, philosophy to geography, to anthropology, to medicine, uh, all the way to actually producing food in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. So we've got some great expertise. All right, well, as Doug mentioned, the annual Food Systems Summit draws scholars, practitioners, and food systems leaders to discuss the pressing food systems issues facing our world. This year's summit addressed several themes including constraints we face for food production globally and the implications of behavior and culture for our food system. Helping to frame the discussion of those issues were keynote speakers Rosman Naylor and also Nicholas Freudenberg, and we're fortunate that both professors are able to join us this afternoon. Rosamond is the director of the Center on Food and Security and the Environment at Stanford University, and Nicholas is distinguished professor of public health at the City University of New York. He also directs the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College. Thanks so much for being with us. Now, Ros, maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit about what drew you to be the keynote speaker at this summit. Yeah, I was so happy to be asked to come here. I was actually a student at UVM in 1976, oh, no so it's almost 40 years ago. I was anxious to come back to campus, but my husband also has family ties here, and um, Vermont's such a progressive state. I thought it would be really fun. It's, it's local and locavores, um, but I really wanted to see how to scale up the spirit, the commitment that Vermont has to the global issues that I deal with. I thought it would be a fun challenge. And so much of your work relates to resource conservation and food security around the world. What issues do you see globally that might impact us here in Vermont? Well, the most obvious one is climate. And I think Vermont just had a climate assessment um, recently. And uh, climate is definitely gonna be a game changer of this century for agriculture and agriculture's causing climate um, through land use change and uh, fertilizer use, nitrous oxide emissions, methane. So it goes two directions, but it is gonna be the most important thing I think that Vermont is gonna have to grapple with um, over this century anyway. The other major trend that I'm seeing internationally is just growing inequality in the world actually. And I know Vermont suffers the same sort of trends that the country does and how to reach the poorest households in terms of food security and providing nutrition. Um, is a challenge that I think Vermont will continue to face. And so, Nick, in this country, many public health discussions revolve around obesity. Based on your experience and research, what's at the root of obesity? Do people just eat too much or they eat the wrong things? Is there something more at play here? Well, I think it's a little bit biology, a little bit economics, and a little bit politics. The biology is that humans evolved in a time of scarcity, and so we were hardwired to crave sugar, salt, fat. And when we evolved, 
it was in survival interest to stoke up when you found some. Right. But today that's no longer true, and too much fat, salt, sugar puts people at risk of premature death, preventable illness, and obesity. But the food industry that has evolved in this country over the last several decades has found it more profitable to produce products that make people unhealthy than to produce healthy products. And, and then we have a political system where the power of corporations and their ability to influence policy has really grown. And so today, in most parts of the country, unhealthy food is cheaper and more available than healthy food. And so I think the solutions to obesity are uh, solutions, political solutions, that need to be worked out in our democratic system. Mm -hmm. And so are there inroads that have been made to influence how to get people to eat healthier? Yes, and I think we've made some good progress. We've seen for the first time a stabilization of the rates of childhood obesity in many big cities, including New York City, where I work. And I think that's good news. But we need to do much more, and we need to change the, uh, this inequality that Roz was talking about, which I think is really a driver of so many health problems, including obesity. Obesity rates are much higher among poor people because healthy food is harder for poor people to get. And so that is really what we need to change. And so finding ways to make healthy food more available and to reduce the promotion and unavailability of unhealthy food, foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugar, those are the policies that we need to be pursuing. It seems almost overwhelming, though, if you look at, at the big picture. Is part of what you want to do to get people to focus on, on the smaller picture, which would be what they can do in their communities? Well, I think we, we need both local action and global action, and the trick is finding the best combination. Yes, I think there's a lot that people can do in their communities, and one of the exciting things about being here in Vermont is seeing all the progress that's been made in getting healthier food on a smaller scale and providing an alternative to big food and uh, industrially processed food. There, there are some good success stories here in Vermont. Now, Roz, I know that you um, recently visited Indonesia. Tell us about the visit and what you learned. Oh, well, it's just, it's so interesting going into the field. And one of the fastest growing crops in the world is um, palm oil, which is contributing to the fat <laughs> that we're talking about here. Major commodity doubling in volume every decade, basically. What's it used for? What's it used And in? it's used for cooking oil in particularly China and India, Indonesia, the emerging economies. But it's also used in a lot of the processed food that we eat. So when we're having the discussion about obesity, um, palm oil is a major ingredient in that, as well as in cosmetics and other lubricants manufactured. So it's this massive commodity because it's so lucrative, easy to grow, extremely high yielding in oil per hectare. Um, it's, it's just a business opportunity for some major, major companies. And unlike earlier agricultural growth that focused on smallholders and food and staple foods, this is a commodity system. It's really a singular system in very large areas, 10,000 hectares, 20,000 hectares, um, that a lot of people are making a lot of money on. And I think what the most interesting parts to me of going to the field were, I can see the negatives, but when you get to the field, you can see some of the positives too. You can see people lifted out of poverty who are now smallholders working in mm -hmm. this activity. And so their food security is actually improving. They're sending their kids to college now. and. Um, and you can also see big companies starting to um, really respond to the pressure of NGOs and the environmental community and say Europe's blocking some of the environmental practices um, and responding by really trying to do everything much more sustainably. And, and that, this could be the first huge major commodity system to take traction in trying to get a, a major sustainability path. Um, so it's a very, there are a lot of grays, gray zones in this equation, which makes it particularly interesting. But because it's such a huge commodity, I think it's, you know, everybody should be interested in knowing uh, what it is. It's in all of the food that we eat, if you eat any processed food at all. Mm -hmm. And so does this, does this industry um, see the benefit maybe of being out in front saying, we're making these changes? I mean, is there a certain cachet that yeah, you can... Yeah, there, there are certain, certain companies that really want to be out in front and want to be just uh, pushing, you know, a much more sustainable practice. Now, this would include zero deforestation, uh, low-carbon 
uh, you know, low carbon stock kind of land use change because the kind of activity that oil palm is involved in is clearing land that contributes to climate change and right. that it's releasing a lot of carbon. So these are companies, you know, there are companies at the front that would really like to do this much more sustainably to involve smallholders, reduce poverty and so forth and be seen. Um, as, as much more responsible companies. On the other hand, there are a lot of companies that aren't like that too. And so the tr challenge and the trick um, for our participation, say in NGOs in Vermont or elsewhere, is to not completely alienate the private sector, but figure out what parts of the private sector are really trying to be progressive and lead on the sustainability front and which ones aren't. Because if you just get rid of the private sector altogether, you're probably going to end up with some rogue companies out of Indonesia or Malaysia or China that are just don't care about these issues as and much I, as I the think we've learned one. two things from our experience, both here in the United States and globally. One is that companies make changes when there's pressure on them, as you said. Mm -hmm. And I think the food movement can take credit for, for really changing the equation and putting a lot more pressure on food companies. And second, those changes are sustainable when government steps up to the plate and says it's our responsibility to protect public health, to look after the health of the public, and that industry can't do it by itself, uh, people can't do it by themselves. It's when each decides on what their appropriate roles are, the citizens, government, and industry, and uh, steps up to the plate to take on those roles. Yeah, and exactly the same on the land use change in Indonesia. The government has to reinforce it with good land regulations, land use change reg regulations. Are you optimistic that that can happen? I'm almost only uh, semi-optimistic in mm -hmm. Indonesia. I've worked there for a very long time, for 30 years, and, um, and I know that there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a fair amount of corruption and there's a lot of relationships and deals that go on that it's not that easy <laughs> but but I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic um, and I'm most mostly optimistic from some of the companies that I see trying to really change the game and these are you know some big companies international companies but I'm mixed <laughs> <laughs> and so what opportunities do you see for communities in Vermont and elsewhere to address some of these issues well, I think uh, many communities are beginning to create an alternative food system, community-supported agriculture, public markets, uh, uh, institutional food programs, school food, hospital food, child care food that offers an alternative to industrial processed food that's a, a public sector that's a little bit outside the market system. And I think that both puts pressure on the food industry to compete with this public sector, and it also uh, creates an alternative, especially for low-income people, to have a source for healthy, affordable food that isn't highly processed. So I think that's, uh, and, and Vermont has really been in the forefront of building up this uh, public, nonprofit food sector. Yeah, the nonprofits are really interesting in Vermont. I think there's about 3,600 of them actually operating in Vermont right now. And when I was in the field, one of the big observation was the NGO community is really pressuring companies and governments to change, and they're listening. So uh, being a small NGO operating in some rural town in Vermont can have actually a big voice overseas as well. That's pretty impressive. Um, you know, this is nothing new to, to our viewers. I mean, this, these have been huge issues here in Vermont for a long time, and yet still, you know, there are people who um, are food challenged, who only have X number of dollars to buy groceries, and so, of course, they're going to go for the more processed, cheaper foods. How do we continue to reach out to those folks, do you think? Well, again, I think uh, public policy plays a really important role, making sure that every school serves healthy food because children uh, around the country depend on school food programs, both lunch and breakfast programs. Uh, and I think also uh, making sure that the uh, SNAP program, food stamps, uh, isn't cut disproportionately in order to give tax breaks to wealthy people and corporations, uh, ensuring that our food uh, security programs uh, meet people in need. Those are all ways to uh, help the very large and unconscionable portion of our population that still uh, sometimes goes to bed hungry. Well, yeah. I want to thank you both for joining us today. We're just about out of time. If you want to learn more about the University of Vermont's uh, work on food and food systems, we encourage you to explore the website listed on your screen. Go to uvm.edu slash food systems. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.